You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Welcome back, Pithy listeners. Last week, we discussed Hawaii's Kamehameha the Great and his unification of the island chain, the rise of a quote-unquote traditional monarchy, and the overthrow of its 1,000-year-old religion and traditions. But as we went along, we also heard how Hawaii's open arm policy toward foreigners and new ideas led to the devastating loss of 84% of the native Hawaiian population. Just fathom that. I can't! 84%. I mean, we talk about a lot of atrocities in American history. November is now because we're trying to revamp the whole Thanksgiving fiction? Myth. So now it's the Indigenous Peoples Month, and Hawaiians deserve their place. 84% were devastated by opening up to the West, and then, as we'll see today, the United States didn't, um, we didn't do great things. I'm shocked, obviously. I I don't want to get into debates about whether or not, it's history, it's too late, but people were hurt. It's history, it's too late. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Jesus, Caroline, then why are we doing the podcast if it's too late? (laughs) We can't fix, but we can learn from it. Exactly. We can change the past, but we can absolutely make sure that we honor those who went before us and learn from their mistakes. Yep. Kamehameha the Great was followed by his son, Kamehameha the Dissolute and Weak, who died young. Wait, is that his (laughs) official? No. No. Okay, not an official epitaph. But we discussed last week that he was dissolute and weak, and he died young, joining a huge percentage of Native Hawaiians whose immune systems were overrun by foreign European diseases. And thus, he left the Hawaiian crown to his nine-year-old brother, who chose the incredibly original and regal name Kamehameha the Third. I'm just gonna guess. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's amazing. Listen, if you're gonna form a quote unquote traditional monarchy, I guess you, you should it. start with the Louis 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 effect. Yeah. Exactly. If you did not get a chance to listen to the rise of the monarchy, the first half of this two parter, I highly suggest that you press pause now and come back to hear about the fall after. Because, you know, order. As always, please like and follow us on all social media sites. And if inclined, feel free to leave us a review or give us a five-star rating. The more you do, the better we can get out to other people. Exactly. Unfortunately, iTunes doesn't care about quality, just clicks. So the more (laughs) clicks, the more we get to do this. Help us help you. Now, let's keep this podcast pithy and get going. Pithy is the name of the game this week because King Kamehameha the Great died in 1819 and the unified Hawaiian monarchy that he began ended just 74 years later. So to get there, we have to pass through seven more monarchs, innumerable constitutions, a ton of broken treaties, and a lot of tax laws. So we are going to hit the highlights, but skip the minutia. Wait, you mean we aren't gonna get to discuss tax law? (laughs) Oh, a teeny, I mean, I think I have a sentence if you're desperate. Okay, well, that's enough. I mean, basically, I do enjoy tax law. People don't want to pay Um, them. Yeah. Okay, fair. Born Kaui Keauli, the eventual king, Kamehameha III, was the second son of Kamehameha the Great and his most noble wife, Queen Keopulani. Full brother to Kamehameha II, the dissolute. Right, and full son of Kamehameha the Great. Got it. He was of the highest kapu, just like his brother, but he was still a child when he came to the throne. At nine years old, he should be, I don't know, learning his times tables, not ruling a country. And so he needed a regent, which (laughs) historically always works out oh so well. Things like hide you in a tower and kill you or poison you or just lose you. Lose? Yeah, just lose you. Who was lost? I mean, kind of the the kids in the towers. Kind of. The princes in the towers? Okay, all right, all right, I see where you're going with that. So the obvious choice of regent was the intrepid vice king, Queen Ka'ahumanu. She had co-ruled with her Hanai, or adopted son, Kamehameha II, and I think it's pretty safe to say that she took care of state business while he drank and made ill-conceived plans. 
She almost certainly knew more about the state of the kingdom than Kamehameha III, so she took over while he finished elementary school. Fair. Queen Ka'ahumanu, as we learned last week, was a fascinating and incredibly forceful woman. She was Kamehameha the Great's favorite wife, to whom he'd given his firstborn son to raise as her own. And she also had pulled a Kanye West of sorts, interrupting Tay Tay, I, I, I mean Kamehameha II's, coronation speech to announce that actually she was supposed to rule. I get it. Weak and ineffectual. So for better or for worse, she didn't let the loss of her adopted son keep her from her work. Despite never officially converting to Christianity, she was a very devout Protestant. Minus the two husbands who were father and son. Well, yeah, minus that. I mean, we, we all need our vices. I mean, Erica. no judgment, just stating fact. Yeah. I don't I don't know that that's something that the church would like, would like? smile Probably on. not. Yeah. I definitely have full-on fascination and lots of questions, but yeah. despite her unwillingness to break from that one last Hawaiian custom, she generally was a zealot, a Protestant zealot. She expelled any Catholic missionaries who clearly had just arrived too late to make their mark. And she also refused her people religious freedom. It was her way, and by her way, we do mean do as she says, not as she does. Or the highway. Like any true ruler. Wow. I like how you're just like, yep, she's fine. She's got it. Listen, the men do it. That's They do it this way. I don't disagree. If a man married a woman and her daughter, I would also have questions. I'm more so talking about like the do as I say, not as I do. I see what I'm just playing with you. No, <laughs> I do agree that, you know, rulers are fallible, just like people. and we all. But not James the first. James the sixth. Satan's. Satan's chief enemy honor hawaii at the time was however really struggling new ideas new cultures new identities left a lot of people feeling helpless and lost violence and lawlessness abounded theft was common widespread drunkenness vandalism and of course rampant venereal disease hawaii needed stricter laws and better enforcement forced to accept a complete overhaul of religion and customs and culture all while enduring the pain of losing 84% of your people. That's literally like multiple deaths per family. Yeah, just in droves. Mostly it was entire families, entire generations just wiped out. It, it was aggressive. And so at this moment, the people looked to this strong ruler, Regent Queen Ka'ahumanu, and then she died. Well, that's not helpful. It's not. It's not helpful at all. Before her death, Ka'ahumanu felt that these new laws should be based on the Ten Commandments. Assisted by American missionaries, whom she was, you know, very close with, she planned to recreate Hawaii's legal system around the Bible. And when she died, her regency was taken over by Kinau, Kamehameha the Great's daughter and the much older sister of Hawaii's boy king. Well, there you go. Another woman in power. I'm happy to see it. I will say, the the Hawaiians do not seem to have a huge issue with women being in power. Like we talked about with Kapu, the separation of the gender was not because one was less and one was more. In many ways, it was just they separated the genders to keep this cleanliness, I think kind of kosher with the Jewish culture. But they really did not seem to have a problem with powerful, strong women, which is excellent. Good for them. Like her predecessor, the new vice king was also extremely pious. She not only encouraged the missionaries' influence, she actually increased their power through an effective unification of church and state. That does not bode well for anybody. No, it does not. By age 17, Kamehameha III was ready to rule, or at least he thought he was. I definitely felt that way at 17 too. Oh, I ruled the world at 17. I knew everything. <laughs> he was extremely concerned because he felt that the missionaries had too much power and that the monarchy had, well, too little. The king and his regent were very much at odds as the future of Hawaii remained so uncertain. And the two continually butted heads, but in the end, they did reach a compromise. They devised a new government that split the leadership power into three. The king, the Kuhina Nui, or vice king, and a newly formed council of chiefs. 
Together, they drafted a new law code, the first to be formally written down in Hawaiian history. And it emphasized these punishments for lawlessness, theft, murder, drunkenness, adultery, you know, the fun stuff. They also agreed on the need for better education. What had previously been reserved for the children of nobility was now to be shared with the common people. Free schools were established throughout the islands intended to promote literacy and the Protestant religion. I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. By 1840, Hawaii had a constitution that, for the very first time, gave the Hawaiian people representation within their own government, converting the island nation from an autocracy into a constitutional monarchy a la Great Britain. Okay, so from a modern standpoint, yay, that all sounds good, but it's hard to believe that just 21 years before Kamehameha the Great, uniter of all of Hawaii, was an autocratic ruler who skillfully played the world's most powerful nations against each other. And now, you know, the monarchy is a figurehead. It's a pretty big change, and very quickly. Yes, while most of Kamehameha III's constitutional changes were, I agree, for the better. At the time, as you say, it was a very big change, and it had to be a bit of a blow. I would think for him personally. But you gotta kinda look at the influences. Within Hawaii at the time, Great Britain was very prevalent and they were a constitutional monarchy. And then of course the United States was a very big player and was completely democratic. So the fact that he remained king at all was something of a miracle. He could have just lost it. Kamehameha III, unlike his two female regents, was not convinced that Protestantism was the way forward. Oh, I'm shocked. Because, <laughs> I mean, after all, they're literally taking his power away. While he accepted the monarchy's limitation of power, he really struggled to give up a lot of the old customs. For example, like his brother before him, he was in love and hoped to marry his actually full sister, Nahi Ena Ena. But... That didn't go over well with these powerful missionaries or his Protestant big sister slash regent, Kinau. And so like many, many royals before him, the young king was shoved in a corner while the Council of Chiefs, who pushed for a more familial marriage to secure that noble blood, fought against the Protestant missionaries and their desire for a Protestant, but mostly completely unrelated, queen. The poor boy was just a pawn. So in 1832, he fell in love again with Kalama, daughter of the Honolulu Harbor Master and the eventual Admiral of Hawaii's Royal Fleet. And this choice satisfied no one. Because she's a commoner. She wasn't royal enough for the chiefs or Protestant enough for the missionaries. But finally, this young monarch, we gotta give him credit, he stood his ground and the two were married on Valentine's Day. I have no idea if that was on purpose or not, but it's cute. <laughs> they became the first Hawaiian royal couple to practice monogamy, as in just one spouse. Maybe that satisfied the missionaries. You can't win them all, but that's not nothing. It's something. It's not nothing. But he did also have a prominent mistress and two illegitimate children, so I, I don't know how they viewed that. If it was cool because it's not legal, or if it was still bad because it was a sin to their way of... Anyway, <laughs> but he and his new queen were absolutely beloved by the Hawaiian people, and the royal couple then had two legitimate children, although they sadly died in infancy. Oh no! We talked last week that there's going to be a lot of childlessness within the Hawaiian monarchy. It is not stated anywhere that I saw that it is definitely because of continual incest and inbreeding. But I mean... But one could guess that affected at least some of the births. The first half of his reign really did look promising. It seemed that he reached a happy medium between the old ways and this new modernization. His Declaration of Rights, Constitution, and a collection of laws were all then called the Kumu Kanawai, or Foundation of Law. And they were based off of both Kapu traditions and Christian principles, so they did reach this nice medium. Kamehameha III also formally separated the Hawaiian state from the Protestant church, hoping that his people would not completely lose their culture to these zealot missionaries. So... All of that sounds good. Lovely. So there has to be a but coming on. Yeah, it's history. There's always a but. Always a but. Always a but. And sometimes it's huge. I like big butts and I cannot lie. Well, perhaps the most... You didn't laugh at what I... Th I really thought you were going to laugh at that. <laughs> you did it three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, did, you don't remember it? <laughs> Actually, three weeks ago you sang it. 
<laughs> well, perhaps the most promising action of his reign was the Great Mahele, or Land Division. Prior to this, all Hawaiian lands were the exclusive property of the monarchy, mm -hmm. but Kamehameha III wanted his people to have their own share of their land. And so he parceled out land to native Hawaiians with official and very legal titles. And this could have been, could have been a great new beginning. Unfortunately, many native Hawaiians were unaware of the program and never received their share. And those that did often immediately turned around and sold their given land to foreigners to make a quick buck. So in the end, the foreigners bought up most of it and were happy to create major agricultural industries of rice, sugar, and coffee that were now legal and theirs and not Native Hawaiians. Hmm. Hmm. And from there, things got worse. Huge agricultural plantations need labor. And thus, in 1852, the first of many Chinese immigrants were brought to Hawaii. And while these new workers were determined to make a better life for themselves, and they did become a large and important part of the Hawaiian population and culture, they were forced to work for starvation wages, they were treated terribly by the plantation owners, and they were refused equal rights. But most of all, with immigration comes disease. Smallpox arrived with the first wave of these Chinese laborers, and it devastated the local Hawaiian population again. Oh no, we can't get much higher. No, we really can't. That percentage can't get higher. We can't afford to lose many more. No, no, no. <laughs> so as one biographer said, Kamehameha III's rule saw the dying of one culture amid the birth pangs of another. Yeah, man. Which I thought pretty much summed it up perfectly. And then he died. That tracks with this episode. Finally, you're the Debbie Downer. As it's called the fall of the Hawaiian monarchy, I'm not quite sure why anyone's very surprised by that, but yeah. You would call me out. So he got a cold and then he just gone, poof, leaving his throne to his nephew because both of his children had died in infancy and his Hanai son, Alexander Liholiho, who then became, drum roll please, Kamehameha the fourth. Yes, number four. As I'm going to refer to him because honestly, I'm just tired of typing Kamehameha. It's, number four was of a new generation. And number four was the fourth of four brothers. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean. It's just a fun coinkydink. Is it a fun coinkydink? Or did all three other ones have to die for him to get no, here? No, <laughs> they didn't. That's an interesting question. He did have three older brothers. Wow. But only he, the fourth son, was adopted by Hanai to the sadly childless king and queen, and he was named crown prince at a very young age. So while I'm sure the brothers were like, what the hell? Yeah, I can't imagine that the older brothers were too thrilled about too this. Too pleased, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was he was the fourth. The others didn't have to die. In fact, spoiler, one will become king next. Oh. So it's interesting to have it go in the opposite order. He was by far the most European, or I guess Western Hawaiian monarch so far. He was stylish, debonair, elegant. And like his wife, Emma Rook, who was the daughter of a chief and the granddaughter of John Young, one of the two British sailors that Kamehameha the Great had kidnapped and turned into his own statesman. Oh my gosh. So again, didn't have any problem intermarrying, intermingling, and giving power to new people. So number four, like his wife, Emma Rook, was very well educated. He liked horseback riding and cricket, and he put on musicals and operas. He was likened by a few historians to Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria, the ruling British monarch at the time. And I think it's actually a, a really good comparison because he was pretty modest, intelligent, forward thinking, pretty reserved. And his biggest concern, similar to Albert's, was the health of his people. All of this sounds good. There's gotta be... We're, we're on the right path. Yeah. He begged... What just... <laughs> He begged the legislature to build a state hospital, but he was ignored, obviously. So instead, he and his wife, along with their rich friends, just financed the Queen's Hospital themselves. Well, good for him. I mean, really good. This is good stuff. He resisted missionary involvement in government. He was concerned that American Protestants might start to... <gasps> 
look at Hawaii as, you know, like a part of America, which he Shock. rightly believed would result in annexation by the U.S. and the destruction of the monarchy and the Hawaiian independence and culture as we know it. It's almost like he had a crystal ball. We got some divination going on. And he really, really disliked America. In his youth, as part of his Western education, he had toured Europe and America. And while he loved Europe for its culture, he despised America for its racism. While traveling through Washington, D.C., a train conductor mistook him for an African-American and asked him to leave his first-class compartment. Things were eventually explained, but I mean, the damage was done. I cannot imagine a king being told, you need to leave your compartment. And after the Hawaiians had been so welcoming to all of these foreigners, mm -hmm. his wife is, I guess, what, a quarter white. And so it was no problem for them to have people of different yeah. look and stature and color and build come in and intermarry. They did not have this problem. So I think it was a very foreign idea to him and shocking, enormously disrespectful. Yeah, absolutely. Enormously troubling. Queen Emma did eventually give birth to a young Prince Albert. What a nod. Uh-huh. Victoria was known to be very susceptible to flattery. And uh, perhaps number four really knew how to be a statesman like his grandfather, Kamehameha the Great. And he was the first prince born to a reigning monarch in a very, 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 very long time because they kept not having children. Wow. However... Prince Albert died at age four. Oh. And that was followed quickly by his devastated father, who just never recovered from his son's death. God. That was it. Goodbye to number four. That sucks. He seemed like he was really good. He was, I'm going to say probably Hawaii's last hope at turning things around, I think. Personal opinion. Okay. Without an heir, the crown passed to number four's older brother, Lot, who had served as military commander under his younger brother. And Lot became... Kamehameha V. Yes. Number five. But not to worry, he will be the last Kamehameha. I mean, this like, time. good, but also sad. <laughs> he won't be the last monarch, just the last Kamehameha. Unlike his brother, number five was less European. He was educated in the same Western-style school, but he was a lot more like his grandfather, the Great, and he wanted Hawaii to revert back to the old ways. He intended to be an autocratic ruler, so he quickly adopted a new constitution to that effect. You know, constitutions don't really work that great if you can change them on a dime. And that will become more and more evident as literally ruler after ruler after ruler just throws the baby out with the bathwater and starts over again and again and again. No. In his new constitution, he didn't technically deny commoners voting rights, but he did limit voting to Hawaiian national property holders. Okay. Not very many of those, which basically took them away from the commoners who had either missed out on that land parcel or had been sold it to a foreigner. Number five also encouraged the revival of many Hawaiian traditions including dying childless. Oh, oh, that was, that was a low blow. But he didn't give his people voting rights. So I'm not, I'm not that upset, sorry. And also he never married. Oh. So he didn't really have the same opportunity. And supposedly he never married on purpose because he was desperately in love with his sister-in-law, the Dowager Queen Emma. Oh my, awkward at family get togethers. Yeah. Supposedly he proposed, not until after brother had passed, and she said no out of love for dead brother. So that's not awkward. <laughs> On his deathbed, number five knew that he was leaving his nation again without a leader. He offered the throne to his cousin, Bernice Bishop, who was a descendant of Kamehameha the Great, incredibly wealthy, cultivated, beautiful, charming, and basically, according to the Hawaiian histories, the epitome of Hawaiian female perfection. Huh. But she said no. Oh. Twice. Twice. She believed that she could do more through her philanthropy, and frankly, she did make an enormous impact on her people without taking the crown. But that is a story for another day. So, after begging Bernice twice to be his heir, number five died with no successor. 
And that was the end of the Kamehameha Dynasty. So until next what? week, I'm Carolyn. No, 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 no. I know there's at least one more. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty famous. We'll finish off the monarchy because, sadly, it really won't take long. Oh, dear. Number five dies. Bernice Bishop refused to take it. And so now, what will we do? Like many European countries before them, Hawaii found itself without a leader and decided to just elect one. Okay. For life. There were two candidates, William Lunalilo, a distant cousin of number five, and Colonel David Kalakaua, a collateral relation of the Kamehameha line. A word I learned from you. That's right, you that. did. I was just That's about to me. say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give you credit. Don't you worry. You have taught me so much about genealogy and like the way to read a family tree. It's disturbing, but you it's know. It's disturbing. Nice. Am I, uh, well, yeah. Some of the connections that just you make. Wait. Well, I mean, it's. Connections for the Hawaiian incest episode isn't great. So yeah, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. I do. There were two candidates. There was a distant cousin and a collateral relation. Cousin Luna Lilo won and became the first elected Hawaiian monarch, the People's King. It's pretty fitting, right? Yeah. King Luna Lilo was described by the Mark Twain or Samuel Clemens, depending on who you ask. He was described as charming and cultivated, although the two really formed a bond over their shared love for alcohol more than anything else. Fair. And it would be alcohol that would fell the people's king just one year after his election. Oh, dear. The Debbie Downering, I'm so sorry. It just... Wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. But within that one year, he did manage to get a few things done. Oh, oh, a new constitution? Yes! He tweaked it. <laughs> because it's proven so very effective. Yeah. yeah. The eye roll is just so loud. Hmm. He wanted to open it back up, make the Constitution more liberal after the autocratic adjustments that were made by number five. But the main focus of his reign was actually leprosy. That's so fun. That's something. Erica, what do you know about leprosy? Actually, I know a decent bit. Leprosy is a skin disease, yeah, and so you get these lesions on your skin and it is passed to another person through touching those lesions. Through contact, yeah. Physical contact, and I know a lot of the time there were leper colonies you would be sent to as to not infect your family and friends. Right. To be among other lepers so that you could die in peace. Yeah, kind of, yeah. It's called Hansen's disease now. Hmm. They also found a cure, so that's lovely. You can't really. You can't undo what's happened, but you can prevent it from spreading. Huh. But around the time of King Luna Lilo's mm. reign, the infections in Hawaii were on the rise, and they seemed to most aggressively affect Native Hawaiians, huh. like pretty much every other disease, because they just had been so isolated for so long. And it led to the creation of the Kalawao settlement on Molokai Island, where Father Damien, a Catholic priest, made it his life's work to improve the situation there. Because originally, when they started sending people there, and it it sounds nice to say we're gonna we're gonna send you to this leper colony, and of course you'll want to do this to save your friends and family. But in reality, they were sending them to this pretty much abandoned island and told them to live generally like feral cats until they just died. It was bad. Yeah, that's not it. It was not good. But Father Damien came in and he made huge strides, not only with researching the disease and encouraging the treatment of the individual sores and trying to keep infections from getting worse. He also made sure they had clean water and food and eventually even jobs and schools. Well, isn't and that nice? There actually is this great book called Molokai by Alan Brennert, and I highly recommend it. I loved it. But Father Damien did eventually catch the disease. He died of it himself after decades. Yeah. This was this was the big focus for the one year elected cousin king. But aside from this new board of health and the segregation of the lepers, he also quelled a palace mutiny. Oh now that's something. Yeah, so he did it through discussion. It wasn't some sort of cool battle where he raged in and was like, I'll fight you to the death. But still, nice work. I know, I know. Downers. I can't, I can't fix it. However, because of this... I just had high expectations, man. This will be a Debbie Downer episode. Expectations managed. 
But because of this small palace mutiny, he ended up having to disband the Hawaiian army, which left Hawaii without any kind of a military force. That, that's not great. Sitting ducks. It's not like they could have come up with a force large enough to fight off Great Britain or the U.S. if they'd wanted to just take it. But it's always good to be able to kind of... Have one. Have one. It it feels better. I would feel better for them. I would too. I don't now. Uh-uh. Also like his predecessor, King Lunalilo didn't designate an heir. When will they ever learn? Supposedly he wished for the Dowager Queen Emma to succeed him. And also supposedly he wished, again like his predecessor, to marry her. But she, again, refused. This woman must have been like the grand dam. She must have been something. Do you want to see a picture? I mean, yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, like. It's, I don't think that they, all these men were proposing over her am looks. Am I gonna, am I, Erica, gonna ride into battle to save her honor or anything like that? No. Would you ride but... into battle to save my honor? <sighs> no! <laughs> oh, but my point is, like, I've seen worse. I've seen worse. I, I think she's actually quite pretty, but she's not. Helen of Troy. No one is. But whatever his intentions, he died before any formal proclamation or written statement could be made. And thus, it fell to the legislature to elect the next king. And they chose his formal rival for the throne, big collateral Kamehameha relative, Kalakaua. Because we can't put a woman on the throne, right, with Emma? Well, no, at least not not completely. Dowager Queen Emma was enormously well-respected, and it's been theorized that if the decision had been the people's, if they had had a democratic election, she would have succeeded. But in this case, Emma didn't really favor the American sugar planters, unlike Kalakaua. And as they say, money talks. So the legislature probably took some bribes or felt some influence or were pushed. Mm. Push seems more likely. Mm. Pushed with money on the side. That's the best kind of push. It, is it? It's the destruction. Better than no money it's- and just death. Fair, but it's this destruction of empire. True, but 50 years ago, Kamehameha the Great was just literally pushing people off of a thousand foot cliff. I guess. I'd take the money and run. But it, my morals aside, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it in this case. Anyway, Kalakaua will be Sai, the last Hawaiian king, but not its last monarch. Known as the Merry Monarch, he was cheerful, charming, and sociable. Known for his amazing, amazing capacity for alcohol. Supposedly, he could drink four to five bottles of champagne in just an afternoon and then walk away like nothing happened. Same. (laughs) I've seen you at a party. (laughs) (laughs) Four to five sips, sure. Okay, Four to five but sips. I will, in my defense, Yes. in my defense, I'm much like... Ding, 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 we're out of time. Okay, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would suck to drink four to five bottles of champagne and still not feel that little tingly... The bubbles. Excitement and, and rush of, you know, being tipsy. Mm. The bubbles. That would suck. Because, I mean, what a waste of good champagne. Anyway... Like every ruler, he had his good and his bad traits, including his alcoholism. So let's start with the good, because that's more fun. And you've claimed I'm a Debbie Downer. Is it more fun? Better than the Debbie Downer shit. Fair. He wanted to bring Native Hawaiians back to the forefront, and he filled most of his administrative posts with Hawaiians. Oh, that's good. Mm Mm-hmm. Much to the displeasure of the American business community, especially after they had literally just supported his rule over that of Emma. Hoo-hoo. All right, bait and switch. Mm Mm-hmm. His reign was regarded as the first Hawaiian renaissance. Oh. Not only did he bring Hawaiians into his government, but he also really tried to bring back some of his nation's culture, music, poetry, and, of course, the hula. He promoted good relations with foreign nations and took a year-long trip around the world, visiting Asia, Japan, Europe, the U.S., you name it. But he also had a habit of granting enormous and very profitable monopolies to his friends against his minister's advice. But that was not a problem for him because he just fired anyone who disagreed with him. He is settling into rulership 
quite nicely. Really well. Yeah. His continual firing and rehiring created a lot of upheaval within the government, something that would come back to bite him in the ass, similar to other politicians we may or may not know of. We don't name names here. We would never. Well, except historical names. Yeah. Once they die, we're happy to... Trash them. Yeah, we're happy to tread all over their bones. Mm-hmm. Kalakaua had grand plans. Not only was his palace, Iolani Palace, updated and now incredibly fancy, a far cry from the previous one-story building that was made of pink coral, this man wanted opulence. He dazzled. He dined in style. It was lovely. There was nothing of the Prince Albert in this dazzling king. And to go along with his fancy court, he wanted to create an empire. Ooh la la. Of what, you might say. He hoped to unite all of the Pacific Islands, with Hawaii as the leader, obviously, into a federation. And a few historians, as in almost all, have referred to these ideas as Machiavellian aspirations. If you're gonna be the prince, be the prince. Yeah, but he wasn't the prince. He was the alcoholic. He really wasn't. But also, nobody is a Cesare Borgia. Nobody is. Even Cesare didn't survive himself. No, he didn't. He didn't. No. Mm -mm. If only he didn't get dysentery. (laughs) If only life didn't organ trail him. So it's interesting to think about all these what ifs and what could have been. But like his reign, this dream of his ended in humiliation. Hmm. His queen, Kapiolani, and his sister, Princess Liliuokalani, went to England for Queen Victoria's jubilee. Due to his health, from alcohol, the king was forced to stay behind. And then, all hell broke loose. His cabinet was overthrown, all government buildings were placed under armed guard, and a new cabinet was installed with a new constitution. Again? That was, again, a new one! Another one! And this one is called the Bayonet Constitution. Kidding. Yeah. This newest constitution absolved the king of pretty much all of his power, taking away his ability to appoint and dismiss his own cabinet and leaving him as absolutely nothing more than a figurehead. So when the queen and princess returned from their nice little jaunt overseas, they found a brand new political landscape dominated by American businessmen and a very ill and dying puppet king. (gasps) He died soon after, leaving the hollow crown to his sister, Queen Liukalani, Hawaii's final monarch. Oh my god, are we going to talk about her? We are going to talk a little bit about her. She really deserves her own episode. Her life is just, frankly, it was incredibly tragic. In fact, When we were creating our children's series, Once Upon a History, I'd actually intended to include an episode about her. But upon doing the research, I decided against it, mostly because we titled our first season American Heroines. And while Lilu Kalani was most certainly a brave heroine who tried her best to protect her people, she was not an American, and she really didn't want to be one. So I felt that it would be wrong to force her into a title that she truly despised yeah we're gonna honor people and their wants and desires let's honor them i think we have a duty as historians to make sure that we present facts yeah and not try to whitewash history secondly almost nothing goes right for this poor poor woman she was unable to have children her husband married her for her familial influence and then cheated a lot and then she hanai adopted his illegitimate children to raise, which was sweet, but... Must have been uh, difficult. And then she watched her brother lose his grip on power before being forced to step in. I mean, she was forced to step in as this final chess piece to be easily taken by the overwhelming power of the American businessmen who wanted the Hawaiian chessboard all to themselves. Oh my gosh. It was just not fit for a children's series. But it is perfectly dramatic for these pithy chroniclers. I mean, it is dramatic. You look so sad. It is sad. It is sad, and it's going to get worse, so buckle up. Oh. (laughs) Queen Liliuokalani ascended the throne nine days after her brother's death, and her four- No. No. Not another one. (laughs) Oh, I see. (laughs) I read read ahead. I read ahead. (laughs) And her first point of order was yet another new constitution. 
Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Which she hoped would restore the monarchy's power. I mean, it's a bit of a Hail Mary. She's like, oh, no, I'll just take all my power back, and I'll give back voting rights to all of the people. And she did reasonably consider the bayonet constitution signed by her brother unlawful. Sure. Claiming that King Kalakaua only signed it under duress, pretty much thinking he'd be assassinated if he didn't. And he probably would have. Could have happened, yeah. Unfortunately, she was unable to overcome the strong pro-American elements in Hawaii, and so though she wrote this constitution, she couldn't force it through. Instead, she was forced to act against her own beliefs to save her nation from its next impending disaster, financial ruin. Hawaii needed money. They were suffering through a severe economic depression after the McKinley Tariff Act killed the free trade that had previously been between the United States and Hawaii. So finally, out of desperation, she ceded Pearl Harbor to the U.S. in return for duty-free imports and exports of America. She also, again out of necessity, signed two highly questionable bills— First, she legalized a government lottery, and second, she legalized the import and sale of opium. Oh my, I mean... To a society that is already heavily alcohol dependent. Yeah. Yeah, that's not great. That's not good. Both were considered highly offensive to many even at the time, but Queen Liukalani felt that she truly had no choice. Hawaii needed money. Throughout all of this, enormous tensions over the subject of annexation to America continued to pull her people apart. Native Hawaiians were mostly against, but some were also for the annexation. And it became extremely divisive. Think Brexit times 10. And then one day, the U.S. warship San Francisco arrived and remained anchored in Honolulu Harbor, ready to protect American citizens and property by force if necessary. Of course it has. Dun, dun, dun. So with that big sword of Damocles visibly reminding the small island nation of the might it was up against, Queen Liliuokalani continued to fight for power and freedoms that she Mm. would never get. Ironically, it was actually this last push for more monarchical strength in an effort to give Hawaiians more control over their own land that led to the breaking point. Key businessmen and politicians of Hawaii formed the Committee of Safety, which pushed, and I mean pushed, for annexation. They created a provisional government and militia and denounced the queen for her autocratic policies. Oh, that's that's rude. Mm. She's it is. She's absolutely not autocratic. All she was asking for was more monarchical power so that she could then appoint Hawaiians to their own government. But they turned it round cleverly and claimed that she just wanted to overthrow the Constitution that they had overthrown. That they with- had made the previous person sign under duress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So why is it the Committee of Safety? No good reason. I I think it likely saved their own financial interests. Because it certainly didn't help with the physical or national safety. Uh. Things exploded when armed companies of citizens marched into government buildings and took control by force. And these citizens, they were not the Hawaiians. Right. The Committee of Safety announced that they now controlled government offices and then they, quote-unquote, legally deposed the queen. Uh. Outnumbered and with no other recourse, Queen Liliuokalani was forced to yield under protest on January 17th, 1893. And Erica, would you please read her final words as queen? Quote, I, Liliuokalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian kingdom, queen, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and impelled by said force, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States 
shall upon the facts being presented to it undo the action of its representatives and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands, unquote. I think you can see why I felt it would be disrespectful to her memory to include her in our series on American heroines. Yeah, girl. Anti, anti, anti American. I get that. The new president of the provisional government named Sanford P. Dole. And Erica, can you guess what Mr. Dole did for a living? Oh, oh, the juice we still freaking drink today, Dole? What kind of juice? Pineapples. Pineapples. He is the pineapple king of the world, actually. So yes, Dole Plantation is still there. Huge popular spot when you go to Hawaii. You can get a piece of freshly sliced pineapple that they then dip into this melted chocolate. Oh, it's so good. It's not. But it's not it's good. Not, <laughs> it's not okay. It does not make up for your behavior. So, the new president... President Dole, or acting president, provisional government, whatever. He acknowledged the document, which was just basically a huge middle finger to him, and then proceeded to raise the American flag over Hawaii. Two years later, Native Hawaiians made one last stand. They revolted, intent on restoring their queen, but the effort pretty quickly failed. Queen Liliuokalani was arrested and imprisoned. And though she was now legally known as Lydia Dominus, her royal titles having been stripped from her, she continued to sign her name as Queen Liliuokalani until the day she died. Good for her. And her people, too, called her their queen. Yeah, because Lydia Dominus is not a good name. It's not Queen Liliuokalani. And that's very Mary, Queen of Scots of her. It really is because... And very Joanna the Sad of her. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's very similar I thought to Mary, Queen of Scots. She's living under house arrest and she died 22 years later in 1917 in her home. She left her people with the memory of a devoted monarch and the beautiful composition Aloha Oe, which is one of Hawaii's most recognizable songs and was featured twice in last week's episode. So, as the song says, until we meet again, listeners, I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by The Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!